Um, other threats um, that we deal with and my company deals with a lot is wind turbines. Um, like those other bats, uh, red bats and hoary bats and silver hairs, we find a lot uh, dead at wind farms uh, because they're migrating. They're kind of in these historical migration routes where uh, there wasn't these giant wind towers before. And so if they're blindly, you know, they're not blind as a bat, but if they're blindly flying through the area, not really paying attention, and then all of a sudden these huge wind turbines are out there, uh, they get caught in the spinning blades. And like even before they crash into them, it's the, uh, the barometric in and kind of just kills them instantly before they even hit the hit the turbine and uh, yeah so we don't we don't there's a lot of studies going into this as well we don't necessarily know why they're attracted to them if it's just uh, you know a, a lot of these wind farms are out in the plains or out in open areas and we don't know if it's simulating a tree to them and all of a sudden they're like I'm tired from my migration I need to take a break and they get close and then it's not a tree or if it's kind of they see a landmark and it's kind of maybe a meeting opportunity for them to maybe swarm or, or you know like I said they go along forest edge and maybe they think it's a forest and they can forage easier instead of just out in the open plains or open agricultural fields but um, yeah it's it's not really stopping where there's developing technology on how to deter bats from from wind farms like noise makers and and stuff like that but uh, they have varying results uh, Scott actually worked a lot of the winter looking at videos, watching bats flying up to turbines, and and what you know if they died or not, or if they were just kind of interested in it. And pretty interesting work. Um, habitat loss is a great is a is a big one, and that's why Indiana bats were listed uh, back in 1967 is mostly because of summer habitat loss, and that's you know going back to their maternity roost, they're losing those, and then if you chop down a tree, you're killing you know potentially 100 bats and 100 young, and that's that's a pretty big deal because that they only reproduce once a year, so they can't just oh I lost my baby, I'll have another one. It's not until the very next year that they're they're having babies. So habitat loss is a is a big one, and then also uh, this kind of ties in with white nose is hibernaculum disturbance. So if, uh, you know, a lot in the past, I've done cave surveys and you find a lot of graffiti and old fire pits and beer cans and everything. And so if kids are going in there and, and drinking beers and having a fire in the cave, that's, that's very disturbing to a hibernating bat. And just waking up and actively having to like either avoid that or, or leave the cave for a little bit just and come back after the disturbance is over, that depletes a great deal of uh, fat reserve for the bats and that can lead to, to death. So, yes ma'am. Uh -huh. No, I'm, and, and yeah, I'm talking about it all. I'm talking about the foraging habitat and the roost tree and, and everything. So I'm talking about specifically the roost tree, but then I'm also talking about their preferred foraging habitat because the smaller bats, like northern long-eared bats, will uh, forage within forest and not, not just along corridors or along forest edge. They like that intact forest. And so if you're taking away foraging opportunities, you're losing bats in that area and they're, they're either going to other areas or they're just dying because they're not having their foraging opportunities. Uh -huh. there, there has been, there has been, uh, yeah, there has been some, I mean, not, not a ton, but I mean, those, yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And, and I actually did part of my master's on a, on a, a, a military proving ground, and it, what we found was it didn't really disturb them that much. You know, they were shooting guns and, and dropping bombs on tanks not far from roost trees, you know, not when I was out there, luckily. Um, but, <laughs> but at, like, later, you know, I'd go out there, find a roost tree, and then there, I'd go back the next day and, like, oh, sorry, we're, we've got training going on, and they're shooting machine guns and dropping bombs. And I was like, well, I hope the roost tree survives. And I'd go back the next day, and the bats are fine, and they're still emerging and everything. So they're pretty resilient. But I mean, the, the habitat loss is more like the, the active taking, taking forest and stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Those, yeah, yeah, and those kind of surveys, and a lot of times, you know, just saving a snag here and there, you don't know, especially if you're going in in the fall and no bats are there, but if you save a snag, that can be, uh, it could potentially be a roost of 100 bats, and you don't know that, so losing, you know, a lot of people will cut down snags in forests and just, you know, they want to get new growth in there, and then they don't realize that they're chopping down a, a huge maternity roost that's been there for decades. I, I can I can definitely send one out to 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 Richard and Mark. Yeah. No, they are. They are. Yeah, from uh, about three weeks after after they're born. So I mean, if they're like I said, we were finding lactating bats. Um, in early June, so the pups are are already born, and then three weeks at earliest, three weeks after that, they can. Yeah, exactly. After August fifteenth, it's it's really rare to find. I mean, it'd be it'd be really. I've never found a bat in August that is still pregnant. I mean, that'd be that'd be really rare. I found some that are still lactating because maybe they had their babies in in July or something, but. Absolutely. That's that's why we have those uh, stringent guidelines because the maternity roosts are a lot more susceptible to to damage and and disturbance like that, and um, because they're they're having babies. And you know, if you if you were to knock down a tree that had a bunch of pups in there, that would be that would be pretty much dead for them. And uh, lose a you know sixty to hundred pups is is a big deal. Yes. No. <laughs> Is there population estimates? I mean, they're doing. They're, it's it's hard to get a population estimate. What we the way we estimate population is is mainly by hibernaculum studies, and so we can give you, you know, pretty pretty good estimates of Indiana bats because that's you know been endangered, federally endangered for for decades, and we've been studying those in hibernaculum. But now this northern long-eared bat is is a new one, and so we're going to be actively looking for that in the hibernaculum. But we can't when we go out and do these surveys. Like I said, we can't do counts with the with the acoustic stuff because it's a passive monitoring, and we could you know oh wow we just had. 200,000 calls in this one, but it was just one or two bats flying in a circle around. And even the mist netting, it's just giving us a, a peek into that foraging habitat for, for that night or those two nights that were there. And so it doesn't really give you uh, an idea of, of what's going on in the entire forest. Uh, something that bat people do is uh, what we call a bat blitz. And we'll go to a specific forest, and it's like set up year, year to year, and we'll go to a forest. and. And it's a good a good time for us to drink some beer and have some fun with other bat biologists. But what we're really there for is uh, we hit a forest with like 30 different bat biologists, and so we hit in in like a, a four day span. We'll just go and survey as much of that forest as we can, and all with permitted biologists. And then we'll we'll know a little bit more. But even that is not is not a good estimate of numbers. It's just what's there, what species are there, and how abundant they are. But not not numbers. Him and then you. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, the habitat loss is is a is part of the problem, but it's not it's not the major one. It, the the fungus, especially for northern long-eared bats in Minnesota and Wisconsin, that's that's the problem. And it hasn't reached those levels where it's you know becoming extinction level events up here yet. And it's not it hasn't reached up here widespread. And I don't think Wisconsin either. Let's go back to that map and we'll take a look. Yeah, there was yeah down there and. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and along those bluffs there, it might it might move northward, you know. But, um, but yeah. So habitat loss isn't isn't as big of a deal. I mean, these the 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 problem we're finding with catching bats out here is that there's so much forest out here, uh, a lot more than we're used to. I I typically, 
Yeah, <laughs> for trying to catch bats, at least, you know, for, I mean, it's great. I love, I love finding healthy habitats because it means it's going well. But, you know, usually for, for my work, if we're doing projects, we're, we're in the Midwest where it's agricultural fields and islands of woods, and we're, we're focused on that, and we don't, you know, it's not a good representative habitat, but... Uh, I don't, I'm not following. No, no, and th there, there's a lot of, ha the, the habitat loss is more like, and this is more directed towards Indiana bats and other bats that are susceptible to that, whereas, you know, with like agricultural fields, when you're, you're clear-cutting forests for agricultural, that's, that's a big chunk of habitat that's now gone for, the, for those bats. But up here where there's, you know, good, good habitat, it's not a big of a problem. The, the habitat loss is just another, a small part of, of, of the puzzle with, along with hibernaculum disturbance. That's not going to kill off hundreds of thousands of bats, but it's another thing that's, that's hurting bats and, and not, not positive. So the, the fungus and the wind farms are the two biggest things right now that are, are doing that. Uh, you, yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> we call them we call we call them bat blitzes, not beer drinking surveys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to be 21, so it's 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 recognized. Uh, no, those those aren't even. We don't do transmitters or anything like that. It's 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 more of kind of a a gathering, and so we can you know discuss how you know surveying is going and how you know exactly exactly just talk about how to how to better our our field and stuff, and have a gathering of a lot of. And in one small area, and, and basically survey, and then then after we're done surveying, then we can have some beers and have some fun, and it's recognized. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. They and that's what they do, but their 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 fat stores are so depleted that it doesn't really matter. They can hibernate, but they're it's still going to eat away because even though they're turned off, they're still depleting. They're still using energy. They're not they're not dead. It's not it's and it's not just a it's not just a hey I'm awake because like I said they'll wake up and go drink some water and that's not going to kill them. They've been doing that for for millennia. But the 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 fungus has them either uh, has their immune system actively waking them up to like make their immune system work harder because everything's basically turned off. And so when this attacks them, it, it could be their immune system is, is going into high gear and turning their body on, and then they're actively uh, depleting their fat stores. Or it could be that it's, it's actively eating, eating away at their fat stores, or just uh, either way, they're like having to become more fully aroused than just a simple, I'm going to go take a drink of water over here and then go back to sleep. They're having to, they're depleting their fat stores. And so when they go out to, Exact. Well, and they, they can go back to that, but it just it's no good because they're still eating. They're still, you know, using those fat stores. Even when, like in a perfect world, they're they're going through those fat stores and they're hibernating. Even when their their bodies are turned almost off, they're not they're not off. They're not dead. They're still their heart is still beating and there still is processes to keep them alive and not freezing. But it's a very very low minimum maintenance level. Um, but so with the white nose, it comes in and makes their maintenance level go up, and it's uh, deteriorating their fat stores. And so when they go out to fly, and you know, and they, they can't just come back because when they go out to fly, they're basically starving and about to die, and they need food ASAP. And if they don't find it, they're they're pretty much done. All right. They will, yeah, yeah. So when they when they walked up to, like I said, when they walked into those caves around here in New York and stuff, they would walk in and they just they saw hundreds, if not thousands, of bats just laying on the ground. And they're, you know, one that's okay. Something's gone through here and disturbed them, or you know, some people lit a fire and woke them up and they died. Go to the second cave, it's happening again. The third cave and it's a problem. And then it's a problem and a problem and it's spread. Yes, ma'am, back there. Yep, there's a lot of that going on. There's uh, CDC is involved, and the Fish and Wildlife is involved. Like I said, uh, go to that website. There's a lot of a lot of studies going on, and I I can't even 
begin to fathom how many there are because that's a lot where the, the bat money is going right now is, is for white nose stuff. And there is a lot of lab studies going on to better understand the fungus. Uh, it used to be just, you know, supposed cause of the fungus, and now it's like it definitely if the, the fungus is the cause. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's ongoing, and there's a lot of money going to it. It's not just uh, wasting money and, you know, hope, I would love to find a fungicide that we can just throw a bomb in there and kill it off and then we solve, solve the issue, but it's not going to be that easy because, like I said, they fly so far and they can intermingle and they can do stuff that we don't know about and it's spread and then it takes off again. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, and as well you should be, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, no. No, not not in that short time period. It's been we've seen those uh we've seen, you know, missed net surveys. Oh, sorry. Um has there been Increases in other bats or bird species making up for making up for the loss of the other ones, and um, like I said, no. Off, you know, after eight years, it's been a, it's been a short turnaround, and there hasn't been something that's picked up the slack right off the bat. But uh, the surveys have, you know, gone out during the summer, and they've obviously found a lot less numbers of northern long-eared bats, the little browns, and uh, the other common species that we typically find. Especially out there, it's becoming a lot rarer to find those bats. Right now, we're catching a ton of northern long-eared bats, but if your state begins to look like Pennsylvania or, or Kentucky or something like that, then we're going to see lower numbers here as well. You know, you can save all the habitat, and you guys are doing a tremendous job. I, w I love driving through this area because it's all woods. It's a lot like Colorado mountains and stuff, but um, if we can't stop the white nose, then it's going to be hard to preserve habitat and save them. But... Yes, sir. You know, we talked about this the other day, but I'd like to hear it. You know, it appears from people I've talked to that there are more hibernacular mountains than we know about, even in this area, from where you're playing. Is there an efficient way to actually find those? Is there an effective and efficient way to find hibernaculum? Um, not really, because, like I was saying with, uh, with tracking, you know, when we talked the other day about it, we can put a transmitter on the bat and hope that it goes to its hibernaculum, but these things are lasting seven to ten days, the transmitters. If, it's, if the bat's not cooperating and going right to its hibernaculum, then that's a, a wasted transmitter and a wasted tracking session, and we have to go out, miss net, hope that we catch the bats that we're looking for, that they haven't already left, and do the process over again and hope that within September to November we're finding them going to their hibernaculum. So that's a lot of, a lot, a lot of manpower and a lot, a lot of money on equipment and tracking basically because if they're if they're on the move if they're actively migrating at night then they're going you know like I said that some of them can go hundreds of miles and so if they travel that way you know some almost the best way to do it is by aerial telemetry and try to track them on the fly and that those kind of studies have been going on in the east where they have money for that but it's not it's not widespread and then the same with um, just actively looking for it the it's basically just going out and searching areas that you think that there would be rocky outcroppings or, or some, some higher hills where some, some portals into the to, to underground are, are there. And, and we have done those studies before and you know found bats flying them. And I actually did one in Pennsylvania where we, uh, we did this survey back in 2006 and we found northern long-eared bats and another bat species out east called the eastern small-footed bat. And we actively found them. Uh, swarming around these small portal entrances, and then I went back uh, two years ago, and there was nothing. There, there wasn't any bats flying in or out of the portals, and I sat there for about two weeks and had one of these and one of those nets going and didn't detect anything except for uh, maybe a passing bat that wasn't even from the cave. It just was passing through the area. So, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of man hours and a lot of a lot of money to try and get those surveys done, but once you do find them, then it's a little, a little easier from there.